The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Nightmare. In the bouncing glare of the headlights, the narrow shoreline road twisted and turned dangerously. Signposts, clumps of pine trees, driveways to darken the state whirled past Philip Adams as he raced through the night, and behind him the sirens grew louder and louder. As Philip Adams ran from the car into the brush, he patted his coat pocket. The bulging manila envelope was still there. Branches tore at his clothing. He stumbled on the rocky path, fell. Quickly, he staggered to his feet and plunged on into the thick undergrowth. And then he heard voices and right, stopped boys. to listen. Turn out. Max, you and Charlie, cover the creek there. Okay. Oh, Eddie, keep that spot on the road, will you? All right, the rest of you, come on. Hey, hey down there, any luck? No sign of him down here, Lieutenant. Bound to be around here somewhere. Are you sure this is the guy we're looking for, Lieutenant? Yeah, yeah, we checked the license number. It's Adam's all right. Mm. Think he might still have the dough on him? Yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> you know, he's no piker, this Adams. 200,000 bucks. Yeah, well, it was easy for him. He worked for the bank, knew his way around. If he hadn't got so anxious and barreled out so fast, ran to get away. Say, but... Lieutenant, huh? uh, I wonder if he had time to make it inside one of these estates along here. Mm, maybe. You'd have a tough time getting into this one, huh? Oh, here, uh, throw your light up there along the wall, will you? Yeah. No, no, don't see a thing. All right. Now, come on. Let's take a look over this way and keep your eyes open. You know, I got a hunch he had a sack across the road. As the officers move away to continue their search, you breathe a little easier, don't you, Philip? Painfully, you crawl from the underbrush and carefully hobble across the street. The entrance gate to the estate is locked. But you've got to get over that wall. A last desperate, agonizing leap gives you one more chance at freedom. But it isn't much of a chance, is it, Philip? As you lie there in a cold sweat on top of the wall, clutching the rough stone with bleeding hands, you feel the sharp pain spread slowly up your leg. You know you've hurt your ankle badly. Luck has been against you from the start. The officer was right, wasn't he? If only you'd taken your time. If you hadn't been so anxious to get away with the money, this wouldn't have happened. The perfect crime isn't so perfect now. Is it, Philip? Moments later, as the moon creeps from behind a cloud, you see the house a short distance away. Its windows are dark. Carefully, you drop to the ground. Move across the lawn. Your twisted ankle making each step an eternity of pain. The windows on the ground floor are locked. Then as you cross the porch, you kick the doormat and hear the clink of metal. 
key. It's a door key. I wonder if... Let's see. Yeah. You open the door cautiously. Smell the musty odor of a closed house. See the furniture covers, the rolled up rugs. <sighs> Heaving a sigh of relief, you close the door. <sighs> Hobble across the living room. In the kitchen, you turn on the water faucet. Let the cold water run over your bleeding hand. And then... Well, <laughs> hello. Oh. Oh, hello. I, I was sound asleep. I thought when you came, the noise of the car would wake me. The car? Oh, you, you mean... I didn't really know if you'd take the train, taxi, drive, or what. That's why I sent you the wire about the key. Oh. Oh, you're the key. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I found it all right. Oh. Oh, your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't notice. Here, let No, me... no. No, it's nothing. Oh. oh, we'd better take care of this. I, uh, I tripped walking up the drive. Afraid I twisted my ankle, oh, too. Oh, I'd better call a doctor. Oh, no, no, please. No, that won't be necessary. No, I'll be all right in a few days. But he lives just down the road. No, there. I don't need a doctor. Now, really. Well, then I'll get some bandages. <laughs> After all, that's what I'm here for. To take care of you. Oh? Oh. Oh, I'm Miss Wyatt. Hilda Wyatt. Oh. Miss Wyatt. Oh, yes, of course. How do you do, Miss Wyatt? In a few moments, she's back with bandages and iodine for your bleeding hands. And you watch her as she runs steaming hot water into a basin and wonder who young, attractive Miss Wyatt is. You wonder, too, who you're supposed to be. It's fantastic, isn't it? To sneak into a strange house and be greeted so cordially by a woman you've never seen before. There, now. If you'll put your foot in the water... Ah! Too hot? Uh, no. Uh, I'll get used to it. It should take the swelling down. Oh. I'm certainly glad you're here. Yeah. This is such a big house. <laughs> I guess I was a little frightened. I've been here alone the past two days. You've been alone? Oh, well, the employment agency didn't want to send any of the other servants down until they heard from Evans. Evans? The, the new butler, you know. You know. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. I spoke to him on the phone last night. <laughs> Sounds rather nice. I think you'll like him. Oh, yes. <laughs> sure I will. Uh... Where is uh, Evans now? He was in San Francisco. He said he'd be down in a day or so. You see, he was under the impression you wouldn't be here for several days. Something you said in one of your wires from Chicago. Oh, yes. Well, I changed my mind. Well, he's likely to arrive any time. Anyway, everything's practically ready for you. I made up your room myself. And if you don't mind my cooking for breakfast... Well, of course not. Well, you're very thoughtful, Miss Wyatt. <laughs> oh, that's just professional instinct. And now that you're here in your new home, I hope you like it. And your new secretary, too. Oh, I I hope so, too, Miss Wyatt. Uh, who told you I was just moving in? Oh, the employment agency. They told me quite a bit about you. And the gardener next door is very talkative. Mm. Says he even knows what you paid for the house. Oh, he'd... ow! Easy with that hand, Miss Wyatt. Oh, I'm sorry. Not much of a brownie, I'm afraid. But I am a good secretary. Yes, I'm sure you are. I appreciate your hiring me, Mr. Crane. Oh, you, you do? Is... Is something wrong, Mr. Crane? Mr. Crane? Huh? Oh, wrong? No! No. <laughs> no everything's fine, Miss Wyatt. Yes, just fine. <laughs> With the prologue of Nightmare, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But now, news about ethyl gasoline. Signal Ethyl is already back at many signal service stations and will soon be available at all signal stations. So tonight, on behalf of all the independent signal dealers throughout the West, I want to take this opportunity to thank you loyal signal customers for your patience during the period when unavoidable conditions made it impossible to supply this extra quality gasoline. 
Naturally, Signal Oil Company is doing everything in its power to get Signal Ethyl into all signal stations as soon as possible, although it will take a little longer to supply stations located farthest from refineries. For your convenience, each signal dealer will post a sign at his station the moment his supply of Signal Ethyl arrives. That sign will be your signal that you can again enjoy the faster starting, more flashing pickup and smoother, knock-free power of Signal Ethyl gasoline. So, for the very tops in performance from your car, watch for the sign at your signal station that says, We have Ethyl. And now back to the whistler. You're bewildered by the curious turn of events, aren't you, Philip? Fleeing the police in the middle of the night, entering a strange house, being greeted as though you belong, greeted by the perfect secretary, Miss Hilda Wyatt, who somehow thinks you're the owner of the estate, a man named Crane. And now as you stretch out on the long leather couch in the study, you can't sleep, can you? This strange refuge from the police is almost as nerve-wracking as last night's chase. Your swollen, twisted ankle makes walking almost impossible. And you know you're going to have to stay here in this house until your ankle gets better. But you think of what could happen. Perhaps the servants will arrive from San Francisco and expose you. Maybe the real Mr. Crane will show up. Something you'll say will arouse Miss Wyatt's suspicion. She'll call the police. As the first rays of the morning sun creep through the window, you try to ignore the pain in your ankle as you slip through the hall to the front door. All you want is escape. Escape to Mexico with the $200,000 you stole from the local bank. And then as you open the door... Oh. Oh. Hello. Just about to ring your bell here. Well, what is it you want? My name's Haskell, Lieutenant, Norville Police. And you're... Uh... Oh, my name... Uh, my name's Crane. I see. You, uh, you own this place? Uh, that's right. I, uh, I bought it a little while back. Willard Crane. He owns the oil club near Reno. Wyatt, good morning. Oh, you shouldn't be on that ankle, you know. I, uh, oh, uh, this is Miss Wyatt, my secretary officer. Oh, how do you do, 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 Miss Wyatt? Oh, so you're the Hudson Crane that owns the oil club, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. I see. Oh, you said you were looking for someone, Lieutenant? Oh, yeah. A man named Adams. He ran off with a couple of hundred thousand from the local bank. He was in the neighborhood last night. Thought he might have climbed over the wall and gotten into the estate here. You, uh, you didn't see or hear anything during the night? Why, no. No, nothing at all. Uh-huh. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Crane. Sorry I bothered you. Thank you, miss. Oh, it's quite all right. Goodbye. Well, Miss Wyatt, you seem to know quite a bit about me. Oh, no, not really. Actually, I only know what they told me at the employment agency. They said you, uh, you were young and rather good-looking... A successful nightclub operator, but I'll learn more in time. Yes, for a new secretary, Miss Wyatt seems to know quite a bit about her employer, Mr. Hudson Willard Crane. Doesn't she, Philip? But it's lucky for you that the employment agency told her as much as they did. You couldn't have told the officers anything, could you? Not even Crane's first name. And you have to convince everyone that you are Mr. Crane for a day or so. Yes, Miss Wyatt was a lucky break for you. She's efficient, too, in many ways, as you find out the next morning. More coffee, Mr. Crane? Oh, no, thank you. This is fine. I thought after you finished breakfast, we might get right to work. That is, if you feel up to it. There are some checks you should sign for the real estate people. Checks? Checks? Oh, well, yeah, I'll attend to that later. And the mail. Your correspondence is piling up. Well, later, Miss Wyatt. Well, all right, sir. Oh, oh, I suppose you'll want to talk to Evans, the butler. Evans, he's here? He arrived a short while ago. He came on the bus. Oh. I'll send him in. No, uh, no, wait, not just yet. But he'll be anxious to know how you want things done, Mr. Crane. After all, 
Some of your friends may be dropping in. And... Oh, Miss Wyatt, please. I, I'll take care of everything later. Very well, Mr. Crane. You notice the strange, puzzled look on Miss Wyatt's face as she turns and walks away. And you wonder if she's beginning to think that something is wrong. You realize that your only chance to evade the police is to stay in the house for another 24 hours, at least until your ankle's better. Yes, that's all you need, isn't it? 24 hours. And the police will have left the neighborhood by then, and you'll be able to slip away unnoticed. But in the meantime, you've got to somehow keep one jump ahead of the efficient Miss Wyatt. And to do that, you've got to know more about this man, Crane. You hurry to the study. Uh, looking for something, Miss Wyatt? Oh, well, I I was just sorting things out. I thought I made it perfectly clear that you were not to bother with business. But these are the files you sent from Chicago. I was just going to straighten them out. Uh-huh. I'll take care of them, Miss Wyatt. M- Mr. Crane, I don't want you to think I was deliberately prying into your personal affairs. I... Oh, I- I'll get it. Hello? Yes, Chicago. Oh, Oh, yes, I'll take the call. Just a minute, Miss Wyatt. Let me have the phone. Well, uh, all right, Mr. Crane. Hello? Hello, this is Mr. Crane. Uh, one moment, please. Miss Wyatt, this is personal. Do you mind? Uh, Of course not. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Crane? Hey, what's going on there? Oh, uh, let me apologize for the confusion, sir. Uh, We were just opening the house, and I'm... Who is this, the new butler? Yes, I'm the new butler. I'm Evans, sir. All right, now get this. I'm leaving Chicago in a few minutes, flying out to San Francisco. Uh, do you wish me to meet you, sir? Never mind. I'll pick up a car at the airport garage and drive in myself. Oh, very good, sir. My plane lands sometime tomorrow. Pardon, sir. Would you mind telephoning uh, from San Francisco when you arrive? Why? Well, I want to have the house ready for you, sir. Oh, of course. You'll be bringing guests, sir? No, no, I... I'll be alone. Yes, sir. One more thing. If anybody asks you, anybody, you don't know when I'm coming back, understand? Oh, yes, of course, sir. I don't want to see anybody when I get there. Just get away from everything and everybody. I quite understand, sir. Uh, Is that all, sir? See you tomorrow, Evans. Your hand trembles as you replace the receiver. You haven't much time now, have you, Philip? And yet, somehow, you sense in all this a real chance for escape. A few minutes later, you put things in motion in a conversation with Evans, the new butler. And you're no longer afraid, because you know now that he's never met Crane face to face. Evans, I hate to have you just arrive and then send you off again, but uh, something urgent's come up. Very good, sir. Whatever you wish. I'm going to have to make a quick trip to Canada. I want you to run into San Francisco and make the arrangements for me. Oh, uh, here's some money. Buy anything you think I'll need. Well, this might all take some time, sir. When oh, it's you... all right, uh... Well, I'd like to leave day after tomorrow, and you stay on in the city until everything's taken care of. Very good, sir. I'll handle everything. Yes, Philip. Evans will handle everything. He's very efficient. Too bad you have no intention of actually using his services. But it will look good to the police, won't it? When Crane finally arrives, and they piece it all together discover that you planned a clever escape to Canada. It will throw them off while you're actually continuing on your way to Mexico. It's later that night, with Evans gone, that you decide to speak to Miss Wyatt, plant some things in her mind that will add to your plan in evading the police. You go downstairs and wonder why it's so quiet in the house. Suddenly you feel panic. Miss Wyatt... Miss Wyatt. Miss Wyatt. You wonder if she's gone, Philip. If she learned the truth and slipped away from the house. And then you see a crack of light beneath the study door. Miss Wyatt. What are you doing? Isn't it fairly obvious? I'm going through your Chicago files again. No, your attitude's pretty hard to understand, Miss Wyatt. I think it's time we talk this over. Uh, Sit down. No. I'd prefer that we stand for this. Oh, God. Stay where you are. I wasn't sure about you until just now, Crane, when I went through your files. 
If I had been, I'd have killed you the first night you were here. What? Do you think it was fun fixing your ankle, cooking your meal? Now, wait a minute. You You've c- heard of imposters, haven't you, Crane? All right, I'm an imposter, but... Look. Look, I can make things easy for you. I've you got You can't 200... give me back Joe Baldwin, Crane. Joe Baldwin? My name isn't Wyatt Crane. It's Baldwin. Edna Baldwin. I wasn't only Joe Baldwin's girl, Crane. I was his wife. Joe Baldwin? Now tell me the name means nothing to you. Tell me that, Crane. You don't remember how you framed him, do you? Wait a minute. This is all a mistake. It's no mistake, Crane. I found out everything five minutes ago. I've never heard of Baldwin. You've got to listen to me. You're all wrong. I'm not the man you You're want. You're Hudson Willard Crane, and you framed Joe Baldwin into the electric chair. Will you wait and a you minute? you double-crossed Joe and me, too, out of enough money to buy into gambling places in Chicago now and Now listen Nevada, to me. And now you live like a king. Well, that's all over for you now, Crane. The law couldn't get you. But I will. You don't understand. I'm not Crane at all. My name's don't Adam. Don't come any closer. Come on, give me that gun. No. Look, I'm not Crane, don't no. you see? You must believe me. Give me that no, gun. No, you try anything, give wouldn't you? But you God. can't get away come with on. it with me. Crane. Crane. Miss Wyatt. You watch as she falls to the floor. A small girl now, small and white. You don't have to feel her pulse to know that she's dead. Numbly, you sink down in the chair, sure that this is the end. A murdered girl in the house. You wanted by the police already. An ankle that won't allow you to walk two blocks. It's all over now, isn't it, Philip? The grand plans for escape into Mexico. Everything's done. You'll be caught and it'll be the gas chamber. As the phone's insistent ringing brings you back to your surroundings... You reach over and touch the cradle, hoping to stop the irritation of the sound. And then slowly it comes to you. Hello. A half-familiar voice on the other end of the wire. Hello. 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 Say, is everything all right there? Can you hear me? This is Crane. I'm in San Francisco. Mr. Crane. Oh, you're in San Francisco. Of course. You asked me to phone. All right, I'm here. Uh, uh, Yes, sir. You sure everything's all right there? Oh, everything's fine, sir. You didn't tell anybody I was coming in? No, I didn't, sir. Good. I'll have a bite of dinner, and then I'll start... Oh, uh, uh, begging your pardon, sir, but, uh, could you hurry? I thought you said everything was all right. It's, uh, something I can't discuss on the telephone. Not right now, sir. But uh, your new secretary, Miss Wyatt, I, uh, uh, caught her looking through your personal files. What? I'll pick up my car and be there in two hours. Very good, sir, and, uh, drive carefully, sir. Yes, you must get Crane to hurry, Philip, because the car he's driving up from San Francisco is your way out. It all came to you when you heard his voice on the telephone. And there'll be no murder charge against you. It'll be against Crane, the one man who had reason to kill this girl. Methodically, you hobble about the room, setting the murder trap. The first thing, wipe the gun free of your prints. Straighten the rug. Turn a single lamp on in the study. Her body's behind the desk. It'll take him a while to see it. But while he's inside, you'll be in his car driving southward, and you'll stop just once to make an anonymous phone call to the police. You smile to yourself as you step outside in the gathering dusk and take your station well hidden behind the porch, waiting for Crane. The two hours seem like years, but at last a black limousine pulls up in the driveway, and a tall, broad-shouldered man gets out. You watch him go up on the porch and push open the door. Hello. Hello, anybody home? And your heart's in your mouth as you see him stoop and pick up the gun that you left lying in the hall. Quietly, you creep toward the car, and then a thought strikes you. Maybe he didn't leave the keys. You've got to have those keys. You're shaking as you come to the car and look through the open window and run your hand quickly along the dashboard. And then... Ah, they're here. I'm in luck. The keys are here. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a tip for you drivers. Since cooler weather is here to stay, the kind of oil that you use in your motor is more important than ever. 
The reason? On short trips around town, your motor seldom gets warm enough to drive off the moisture that condenses in the crankcase. As a result, harmful gums may form, which can damage costly motor parts. That's why Signal brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, an improved type lubricant which contains special scientific compounds. Inside your motor, these compounds go to work to do jobs which a regular oil alone cannot do. One compound, for instance, stands ready to dissolve any harmful gums that might form. Another compound washes out carbon. And still other compounds help in other ways to keep performance up and wear down. That's why Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil is your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. So next time you change oil, make it a change for the better at your nearest Signal service station. It'll take your signal dealer only a few moments to drain out tired old oil and refill with the improved type signal oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. And now back to the whistler. It's been a nightmare, hasn't it, Philip? Your flight. The moments of panic before your escape over the wall to the protection of Crane's darkened house. The worry and constant fear of discovery of not being able to flee because of your swollen ankle. But it's all behind you now. Crane did exactly what you planned. He picked up the murder gun where you left it in the hallway. The gun you used to kill Hilda Wyatt. He's certain to be excused, and you'll see to it that with your phone call to the police. And the confusion of a murder will give you still more time to cross the border into Mexico with your $200,000. You smile to yourself as you open the door and start to slip behind the wheel. Borrowing this car, Mr. Uh, Crane? Oh. Where did you come from? Oh, I've been sitting in this back seat all the time. Look, it's a mistake. I'm not Crane. Oh, is that so? I thought I saw you sneaking out of the house. I just came by to see Mr. Crane on business. And he wasn't home, huh? That's right. Uh... You looking for Mr. Crane? The grand larceny, embezzlement, and a dozen other things. Just had a wire from the Chicago police to pick him up. Police? Yeah. Oh, I'm Reynolds, uh, San Francisco headquarters. But Lieutenant Jeffrey's the head man. You know, he might want to talk to you. Oh, look, I, I don't want to get mixed up in anything. Oh, if you're on the level, you won't get mixed up. I'm in an awful hurry. I, I can't wait for your Lieutenant Jeffries to show up. Don't have to. He's inside now. He's... Sure. Sure, that was Jeffrey's that went in the house just a minute ago. I mean, that wasn't Crane? I thought you said you knew Crane. Oh, well, uh... You know, I think we'll both go inside. Lieutenant Jeffrey's might want to ask you some questions. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Joseph Kearns and Eve McVeigh. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed tonight by Sterling Tracy. With story by Robert Eisenbach and Jackson Gillis and music by Wilbur Hatch. And was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>